know David from uh, some of his Olympic Julia tutorials that are all over YouTube um, that he gave at uh, uh, various uh, Julia cons and other and other meetings. And so thank you very much for accepting uh, to give this talk, David. Um, I will just ask the audience to stay muted. Um, uh, during the talk, but uh, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or feel free also to type them in the chat and I can uh, read them to David. Uh, you can, of course, reserve your questions for the end. Um, and so today I will just uh, um, let uh, David take it away and talk about uh, global optimization with interval methods in Julia. All yours. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dominique, uh, for the invitation. And I indeed was very sad not to be able to go to Montreal in May and uh, looking forward to the next time when we can actually meet in person. Uh, so <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. So I, uh, as Dominique said, I would like to talk about global optimization. And to do that, we're going to use uh, interval methods. So methods based on interval arithmetic, and that will enable us to get guaranteed or rigorous, actually, mathematically rigorous results uh, for the global optimum of, of a given function. And I'll use Julia uh, as the substrate for the computational side, and I'll sort of try to uh, explain a few few points about why Julia is so, is so good for this kind of, of work. So this is... Uh, I, I've been interested in, in interval methods. Actually, basically, we started uh, with my colleague, Luis Bennett at UNAM, uh, the National University of Mexico. Uh, we started working on these methods seven years ago. And at the same time, basically, almost as we discovered Julia. And it's just a perfect, perfect match, really. So, um, so I'll start off by saying, so, so what does interval arithmetic actually enable us to do? It enables us to calculate using sets. So we're going to do calculations on complete sets of real numbers uh, all, all at once in one, in one sort of one go. And so why do we need to do that? And then I'll introduce interval arithmetic and uh, we'll show, see how to do that in Julia. And then I'll say, uh, you know, we'll, we'll explore one uh, particular algorithm to do global optimization using these methods and very related to that, how to find roots of functions. And um, uh, I'll talk about constraint propagation as a more advanced uh, algorithm. And if I have time, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a bit about parallel computation. So as I said, this is a collaboration with Louise Bennett. And the last part on uh, GPUs in particular with Alan Edelman and his group at the Julia Lab at, at MIT, where I'm on leave. So uh, I guess everybody here knows a lot about optimization, much more than me, probably. So uh, <clears throat> I just would like, like to motivate the, this work by suppose that we want to find the ground state of a molecule. So we have some collection of atoms interacting with some interaction potential. Uh, uh, so basically the energy that the two atoms have by being a distance R apart. So for example, an, an, uh, two argon atoms would have a potential that looks something like this, it turns out. And so the Leonard Jones potential. So this is a five, cl five atom cluster of atoms interacting via this potential. And then we're going to have a total potential energy of the system, which is given by a sum over pairs of particles, pairs of atoms of this individual potential energy, which just depends on the distance between the particles. And so that, well, it turns out, gives us an optimization problem in nine dimensions. If we want to find the ground state, which is the lowest energy state, the lowest energy configuration, we need to optimize this function and find the global minimum. And this is a result of our calculation using, uh, using our Julia tools, using intervals. So this is an, a configuration that's you know, very close to the provable global minimum. Uh, but the problem is that, you know, as you all know, I mean, model landscapes that you want to optimize look something like this. So say a neural network, you know, so important these days, has all of these local minima and saddle points and, and, and et cetera. And so uh, any local optimizer will just immediately get trapped in one of these local minima. And so we, we really want global optimization. 
So in particular, we want to be able to calculate not only the ground state, but maybe also all of these local minima and saddle points, since these actually represent so in a physical or chemical context, these represent some inf interesting information about the system, namely the transition states between different uh, minima. And that corresponds to finding all of the roots or zeros of the gradient of this potential function. And so that, those are the two basic problems that I want to study. So, um, so let's think about local optimization or you know, optimization using standard numerical methods. And let's look at this particular function that um, William Kahan came up with uh, in 2006. It's just some particular nonlinear function. So I'm gonna be talking about nonlinear, non-convex, mainly, uh, mainly smooth optimization today and unconstrained mainly. Uh, so suppose we want to find the global minimum of this function on the interval you know, that I've drawn here, 1.2 to 1.5. Uh, so it's clear where the global minimum is, it's at 1.2. So now I'm going to, um, it's clear visually, right? So, and, and if you do do some, uh, you know, local optimization, you might fall into this minimum here, which has this strange cusp shape. But, but I, you know, the global minimum looks like it's at 1.2. So I'm going to switch between these slides and, and a Julia notebook. Uh, so here's a notebook. This is the Pluto notebook, which is a relatively recent uh, notebook, which is reactive. So anytime I modify one cell, all of the cells that depend on it will change. So here's my Kahan function, and here's a plot of, of the function with this strange cusp. And you know we can draw more points. If we draw fewer points, so we're, what we're doing is sampling a different number of points on the x-axis. We can actually draw those points in and see you know, where is it sampling the points. And I'm just gonna add more points and we get this sort of the peak or the trough goes lower, et cetera. And so it's you know, kind of unclear exactly what's happening. Uh, uh, okay, so if you actually look at this function, you can see that, oh, there's this log here and then there's a log of something and that something can actually become zero. So when that function become, when that, when that piece of the expression becomes zero, which happens to be at x equals four thirds, uh, this log will go to minus infinity. And so the function actually zooms off to minus infinity right here. <clears throat> but unfortunately, we will never actually see that if we just use normal floating point arithmetic. So let's look at that. So if we, uh, you know, the number four thirds is this 1.333, et cetera. And if we just take four thirds and calculate f at four thirds, we'll get this number 2.3, which is, you know, down here somewhere. Uh, so we haven't actually sampled four third this 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 floating point number four thirds. Uh, but now I can change this four thirds, and I'm going to take the next float after four thirds. So um, you can see that that also gives a number close to two point three three, and so this uh, you know uh, floating point numbers are an approximation of the real line, which are spaced at some some distance, some sort of local distance. And so I'm literally taking one representable number and the next and uh, calculating using, using those numbers. And those, are, those straddle the, the, um, the real number four thirds. So I can actually use the, 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 the uh, rational number four thirds in Julia with two slashes. And then we do indeed get minus infinity. But of course, you will never see that if you actually use floating point arithmetic. So what can we do? How can we do better than that? We can use intervals. So what, does, what do I mean by that? So here's my interval arithmetic package that we've, we've developed. And now I'm gonna do the same calculation, but now X is gonna be an interval. So it's going to be all of the real numbers between 1.33 and 1.34. And I write that with this dot dot syntax that Julia gives me. Uh, there are various other ways you could write it. So when I do this calculation, what is the result? What should the result be? I'm trying to evaluate. So the idea of interval arithmetic is to evaluate my function over an entire range of values in this entire interval. So um, that's exactly what I'm doing. <clears throat> and it will, should give me back then a new interval, which is the range or which contains the range of the function over that set. And, that, uh, and we see that indeed it recognizes that somewhere in that range, there is minus infinity. And so this is, um, you know, uh, this is the, the idea of interval arithmetic is to, to tell us always exactly, well, not exactly, it will always give us a bound on the, the actual range of the function. 
that's so that is just that is the the goal and uh, you know that is what interval arithmetic does for us so we want to calculate the range standard numerical methods provide no me no tools to calculate this it's actually a very difficult thing to calculate because it is actually equivalent to doing global optimization on the function uh, so what interval arithmetic does is provides a cheap computationally cheap way of calculating this but only a bound on the range in general Okay, so we're going to work with intervals, which are, the, uh, and they'll be closed intervals. So, you know, with a standard notation, that's square brackets, so it inclu including the endpoints, and uh, you can use these bars to indicate the endpoints. And then the idea is that we're going to actually define arithmetic operations and elementary functions on these sets, on intervals. So that is something that we don't usually do in mathematics, but we're going to define them in a useful way. And that useful way will be that uh, the result of this operation should give an enclosure of the range of this function. So it should give, you know, for example, x plus y should give a set that contains all the values little x plus little y with little x in x and little y in y. And similarly, x of x should give a set containing x of little x for all little x in x. So that's the idea. So how can we do that? So suppose we have a monotonic function like x of 0.5x. Then, well, it's pretty easy to see how to calculate this, right? Uh, <clears throat> because it's monotonic, we know that the lowest possible value is exponential of the, you know, uh, 0.5 times the, the lower endpoint, and the upper endpoint of the result will be similarly just evaluate the function at the upper endpoint. So that is very easy as long as I have a monotonic function, apparently. So there's one little detail which actually causes a lot of headaches, which is what happens at the endpoints of this interval where I'm actually evaluating this function now. For, for example, if you take the endpoint x equals 1.0, I need to evaluate x exponential of 0 0.5. And that is some real number that I cannot represent as a floating point number. And so which floating point number should I choose? So uh, in Julia, what we can do is say, um, you know, what if I just take exponential of 0 0.5, it gives me some result. And I do not know uh, if that result is below or above the true real number that I should get by calculating exponential of 0 0.5. So what I'm able to do, if I use this interval arithmetic package, it calls into uh, a, a library called CRLibm for uh, correctly rounded mathematics. And so then I can actually write this instead, exponential of 0 0.5 comma round down. And that will, that will force Julia to return the rounded down floating point number. So the, the, the nearest floating, floating point number that is below the true exponential of 0 0.5. And similarly, I can round up. And if you calculate the exponent, if you use now higher precision floating point numbers, which are accessible in Julia using big floats, then you can see that that actually does lie between these two. So these are the two, these are two neighboring floating point numbers that are guaranteed to be uh, the two nearest floating point numbers to the exponential of 0 0.5, the true exponential. And you can check that that uh, is, is true. Okay, and then you can actually, um, and Julia has macros which transform ex syntax expressions. And so you can actually write this as something like at round down x of 0 0.5, and it will put in the round down inside the parenthesis. So it takes in this piece of code and it transforms it into a new piece of code with this round down. That's just a sort of detail about you, which is nice. Okay, so we need to do this rounding every time we do a calculation basically. And one of the ways of doing it is uh, calling out to this library. A an easier way to do it is just to literally take the previous float and the next float uh, every time you do a calculation, which will give wider intervals, but it will actually be faster. Okay, oh, so that's what this, that's called directed rounding. So uh, I need to yeah, round the lower endpoint down and the upper endpoint up. And that's an example of multiple dispatch where we're actually calling the same function. We're defining different methods, different versions of the same function in Julia. And we'll call different versions depending on the types of the, all of the arguments of the function. That's what multiple dispatch means. But what about if I have a non-monotonic function like x squared, that's sort of the simplest 
non-monotonic function, what I'm going to do is actually, you know, as long as I have something monotonic, I know what to do. And so let's split this function into pieces where it's monotone. So in the case of x squared, it's everything that's negative and everything that's positive. And then if I have some input interval that straddles zero, that, that crosses over from one uh, monotone piece to the other, I'll split that interval at this, um, basically the turning point or the, the stationary point of the function. And, um, <clears throat> and then I'll evaluate each separate monotone piece and I'll take the union of the results. So you can go through and do this for every elementary function. It turns out to be quite you know, annoying to do for things like sine and cosine, uh, especially because the turning points uh, for sine and cosine, the, the value, you know, the positions where the derivative is equal to zero are actually multiples of pi or, or pi over two. And so they're actually um, not representable as a floating point number again, and that makes everything even more complicated. But you can do all of that, and that's all done in our package, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so once you've done all of this, what can you do? Uh, so now I have intervals. Uh, well, so how can we actually implement intervals in Julia? Um, so we could do something like struct of my interval is going to have an nth, which is of type float64. So if a struct is like a class in, in object-oriented languages, so it's, it's like a struct in C, so it's just a box that contains data. So inf and soup are going to be both float64s. And then, uh, oh, I have that somewhere else in the well, new interval. Uh, and then I'm going to define what it means to add two of these things together. So I'm going to take the plus function from base Julia, the standard plus function. So what is the plus? So in Julia, plus is a function, and I can look at its methods, its versions, which act on different types. So for example, plus of a polynomial from this package with a polynomial from the same package is defined in, in that package in some particular way. And then plus of a polynomial with a real number will be defined, et cetera. And so, um, there are some large number of methods that, that are listed here. And now what I'm going to do is add a new one for my type. So, uh, so x, which is a uh, new interval, and y, which is a new interval, is going to be, it's going to return a new interval given by taking the infimum. So, so how do I add two intervals together? That what is the lowest possible value I can get? It's the sum of the infima. And the highest possible I can get is the sum of the suprema. And I can get any value in between those. So uh, it's just going to be given by this. And then if I uh, <clears throat> define two intervals, say a and b, new interval of 1 to 2, and uh, b equals new interval 3 and 4, now I can add them together, a plus b. And the point is that even though I'm doing all of this interactively in Julia, uh, it will actually compile down. So Julia is a compiled language, and it will compile down to very efficient code. Even though I have all these types in the way, Julia will actually get rid of all of that, and it will compile down to very efficient uh, code. OK. And so then, there, then once we've done all that, we have, uh, so in, in our interval arithmetic.jl package, you, as I said, you can create intervals with this dot dot. And so, for example, uh, suppose I have an interval called uh, uh, w, which is 1.1, which is a 3.14 to 3.15, so it includes pi. Then I can do things like x of cos of, of w plus 1. So I have some complicated uh, composition of functions. And, and so if at each stage I can define the functions such that the result encloses or includes the, the true range of that function, it will be prop propagated at each step through the other functions. And the result will be an enclosure of the true range of the, com the complete function. So this is, you know, a if you like a, a sort of a theorem or a lemma that if W is in is anywhere inside this set, then X of calls of W plus one is anywhere is somewhere inside this set. This is a bound on the image of the function over that input set. 
that's the idea. And that's the fundamental theorem of interval arithmetic says that that is true. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, there's a little problem with intervals, which is the following. Suppose I want to calculate x minus x or w minus w. Right? So if I take the interval 0 to 1 and I subtract 0 to 1, what does that mean? Well, we have to think about what it means to subtract two intervals. And um, what we would like to happen is we would like this to be the set of little x minus little x for x in this set, capital X. And so, you know, little x minus little x should give us zero, but interval arithmetic does not realize, if you like, that these two x's are the same. And so it will take all, you know, all combinations of little x in that set and little y in that set. And that'll give us minus one to one instead. And so we're getting an overestimate, an over approximation of the true range. Uh, so this is, you know, so you cannot just put in intervals into your standard algorithm because at each step you will be over approximating the range. And so often what you will find is that the answer is sort of minus infinity to infinity. And so what, what actually often happens is you need to redesign your algorithm to take advantage of the fact that you have intervals. But there are ways to mitigate this. So for example, we can split up or mint the initial interval into pieces and then we will reduce this dependency effect. And um, we can also use higher order methods that try to take into account this correlation between the different variables. If we have a one dimensional function, we can also do uh, more, more precise things. Okay, so uh, just some words about Julia. It's a programming language, uh, as Dominique said, that was released nine years ago. It's free and open source and developed by a worldwide community having come out of MIT in the Julia lab where I am currently uh, working. And so why is it interesting? Because it has a sort of pretty unique combination of features, which are that I can use it interactively, as I said, but it can be high performance as long as you, it is high performance as long as you follow certain sort of uh, guide, guidelines about how to write your code. And the code, as, as you've seen, is easy to read and to write, and it feels like mathematics. I can actually use uh, operators that are Unicode uh, mathematical operators. So for example, what is the intersection of the interval from three to five? I'm going to type uh, a LaTeX command and then press tab and it will complete that to the intersection sign. And then the intersection of that interval with the interval from four to six is four to five, et cetera. So I can use, you know, I can write code that looks a lot like mathematics. And so you can basically, if you have pseudocode and Julia code, they actually look very similar. Uh, I already mentioned multiple dispatch, and that actually leads to very high composability, by which we mean that we can use one package together with another package, even if those packages really don't sort of know anything about each other. And I'll show an example of that later. And recently, there's been a lot of work on various different types of parallel computing using Julia. So I'd like to give a couple of examples. Uh, so let's try multiplying two complex numbers in Julia. So uh, we write... Uh, the imaginary part using im so that you know it should be i but uh, or j but uh, you don't want to take over the, uh, the variable names i and j so it's im and then I can look I can say at which and that will tell me which version of um, which version of the times which version or method of the times function am I using and if I click on that uh, link, it actually takes me straight to the source code of Julia on GitHub, which is, you know, defines how to multiply two complex numbers. And you can see that it is exactly what you expect it to be. It's just define a new complex number and with the standard formulae for the real and imaginary parts of the product of two complex numbers. And then the other thing I'd like to look at is what happens if I calculate sine of a real number of a float? Uh, so I'm going to use add edit now, and that will should take me to the source code in my, which is on my computer now. This is now my editor, uh, and I'm looking at the source code of Julia for the sine function. So sine of x, uh, which is a floating point number. So for some reason I'm unable to zoom in. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so what does it do? Basically, uh, if you're within minus pi over 4 to pi over 4, it calls this other function called sine kernel. So let's scroll down and look at sine kernel for a float. 
is these five lines. So that is the entire sign function in Julia, and it is written completely in Julia. And this is as efficient as the previous version that was written in C, or it's even faster maybe. And uh, okay, so what does it do? It defines these variables, y squared, etc. So this is basically evaluating a polynomial, which is some kind of, um, uh, what's it called, uh, min-max uh, polynomial, I've forgotten the name. Uh, and it's using this at Horner macro, uh, which basically evaluates a polynomial using these coefficients. And that is the entire sign function, you know, sign kernel in Julia. So I don't know of any other system where you can immediately drill down and look at the code, you know, for the sign function in such an easy way. And it's written in, in a high level language. So it's actually readable. You know, if you look at the code that used to be there in C, it's pretty unreadable. And now, um, so that's a very nice feature of Julia. Okay, and well, okay, so we have this interval arithmetic.jl package, and one of the main features uh, is that it is almost compliant with the international standard IEEE 1788, which specifies how interval arithmetic packages should behave. Okay, so uh, let's look at an example uh, application. Well, so, uh, so suppose I have a function like this, uh, as I said, so this is x squared minus 2x, which is sort of the simplest interesting function that shows this dependency effect. What happens, you know, so what is the dependency effect? So, so all of these pictures, uh, I'm always going to be drawing the input interval on the x-axis, so here minus 2 to 2, and the output interval that I get by calculating using interval arithmetic is this over approximation of the range is on the y-axis. So here from minus 4 to 6 or something, 8. Okay, and you can see that it's an overestimate because the true range finishes at minus one. So how can I improve the situation? I can actually just start to split up the input interval. And when I just take, you know, divide the input interval into two pieces and do two calcula separate calculations, I see that, well, in this half, it's monotone and I actually, um, I actually find the true range. Uh, but here I'm still overestimating. And so I'm just gonna keep on splitting up the function and taking more and more pieces, and we see that I get a better and better approximation to the true range of the function. Or, you know, I'm enclosing the function. I'm basically enclosing the graph of the function or the relation, if you like. Uh, so I'm basically calculating with relations here. And I've also colored, colored the boxes. So the boxes in green do not contain zero. The, the, the image of the box in, in, in that box does not contain zero, and the blue boxes do contain zero. And so suppose I want to find roots of this function, then this immediately tells me, oh, look, I can throw away all of these green boxes because I know that the range of the function over that, the, over that input box does not contain zero. Therefore, it cannot contain a root in that box. So uh, let's just look at that in a bit more detail. And so here's the same thing for this more complicated function, sine of one over x. And so again, you know, it, it has some horrible behavior at zero, which I'm not actually calculating because uh, things would actually go wrong at zero, but um, it has this infinite oscillation. And so, but as I take more and more boxes, it, you know, I get a more and more refined approximation and I can actually find more and more zeros of the function. So, um, <clears throat> so let's call h of x my uh, the function x squared minus two. Suppose I want to find roots of that function. I can literally say, oh, what is h applied to the interval three to four? It's this interval that does not, we, we see that it does not contain zero, but I can ask Julia, do you contain zero by using the in operator, you know, the nice in uh, set membership mathematical symbol. And it tells me that it does, does not contain zero. Uh, so that's what I'm using just above. But the interesting thing is that I can actually do this with an infinite interval. So a semi-infinite interval from three to infinity, I can also do the same calculation. It will also tell me that it's full. So I can calculate with semi-infinite interval. So uh, I can actually exclude, you know, whole regions of space, semi-infinite regions of space from my search. This is a super powerful tool that no other technique as far as I know can, can give you. Okay, so. Let's talk about uh, how to use this to do global optimization. So uh, as I said, what does interval arithmetic do for me? It provides me with a tool and that tool calculates the range, an overestimate of the range of a function. How can I use this to do optimization? So we need, if we're doing global optimization, we need some kind of exhaustive search for all the global minimizers. 
And uh, so we're going to use a spatial branch and bound algorithm. So we're going to keep track of the upper bound, some of an upper bound of the global minimum that we'll try and decrease as we go through the algorithm. And the idea is that, well, if I find a set X, then um, if I'm looking at a set X, I want to know, is the global minimum in that set? Well, if F of X using interval arithmetic, I calculate you know, the image of F under X, the range, if that is lies completely above M, then I know that the, my set X cannot contain the global minimum, so I'll throw it away. So let's look at how that um, algorithm works. So here is um, code to do that in Julia. Something went wrong, yeah. <clears throat> so here's a function, which is um, x times sine of x in some range. And I want to find the global minimum over that box, so the, the bound constrained minimum. And so what I'm going to do is the red box will be the one I'm currently looking at. And I'm going to have various boxes uh, in a list. And I'm going to evaluate it at its midpoint. And um, that will be an over, uh, that will be an upper bound for the global minimum in unconstrained optimization. And so I'm going to draw this green line, uh, this green horizontal line at the current upper bound that I have found for my global minimum. And then I'm going to move on by bisecting that box. And then I'm just looking at this red box now. And I evaluate it, the function at its midpoint. And I see, oh, I found a lower value down here. And so I'm going to decrease the green line uh, because now I have a better upper bound of my global minimum. And so I keep doing that, bisecting, bisecting, calculating whether I can decrease my minimum until I find this box. What property does this box have? Well, the, when I apply my function to this input interval, I get this output interval on the y-axis, which is completely above my current estimate of the global minimum. And so I can throw it away. And so I keep doing that, going along, throwing away boxes, etc. cetera. And um, eventually, okay, I don't have enough. Uh, sorry, I don't have enough uh, iterations. So I keep on doing that. And I see that these boxes cluster around these two minima, which have the same height. And I'm just going to carry on uh, going along. And so the, the minima are getting, the boxes are getting smaller and smaller until it suddenly realized, oh, look, there's a region over here, which is actually even lower. And so it moved down the global minimum. And then now it's cleaning up and getting rid of all of those boxes that were clustering around these local minima. And finally, it tells me it returns you know, a list of boxes that are now around this global minimum. So that is how the branch unbound algorithm works with interval arithmetic. So um, let's have a look at the code. The code is in this particular version is you know this long. That's just because I tried to write it not too compactly, but it's basically 10 lines of code. That is the entire global optimization algorithm using interval arithmetic that does exactly what I just did. Uh, so I have a, a working, a, a, a list of boxes called working, which is basically a queue in this implementation, but uh, you can use other, it's actually better to use a priority queue uh, yeah, there are lots of details, of course, and if, if you want a, a really good version of this algorithm, but this is a nice, simple one to look at. Um, uh, and basically, I have some tolerance which says to stop bisecting. So what I'm doing is, as I said, I'm bisecting the boxes if I if I cannot get rid of them. Right? And so um, uh, and that's that's in this step here. I bisect them and I push them back onto the queue, and. I have to finish my process at some point. So I have this tolerance epsilon. And when this, the width of a box gets below epsilon, I just store that box in the results, which I return. So let's, um, so you know, when I run this function on, say, x squared minus 2 all squared, so that's a function, you know, a quadratic function that has two equally deep global minima, I see that the, the minimum value of the function lies in this interval between 0 and 10 to the minus 6 because the true result is zero. And it gives me this list of intervals that have to contain all of the global minimizers. And we see that indeed it contains minus the square root of two and plus the square root of two. Okay. And uh, you can do the same so, thing. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, David, there's a question yeah. here. Maybe I can yeah. uh, read to you. Somebody's yeah. asking, have, have you thought about using local optimization to get more intelligent points to split around? Thanks, great question. Yeah, so that is um, on the next slide where I said okay. branch and bound algorithm can easily incorporate local minimization. So yeah, that's a great question. You can just, you know, so basically <clears throat> what I'm doing currently is just evaluating F at the midpoint and that's the way I'm getting a better incumbent. But I'm finding an incumbent by just evaluating F at the midpoint. You could evaluate it at various points in your, in your box, but as you say, a better thing to do is to actually replace this with a local optimization step. And so in Julia, since we have various local optimization packages available, you can literally in two lines, you know, import the package and then maybe three lines or something, import the package and then call local optimization to replace the, the, the local minimum with the local minimum you, you get with, sorry, to, to replace this step or, or supplement this step with a, a local minimization step, yeah. Of course, all of this becomes actually more complicated if you want to do constrained optimization, because then it's actually hard to find the feasible points. And um, that's something that, that you know, I've thought a lot about. It's actually not that easy to do, uh, but um, we can talk about that later. So what happens if I do x squared minus 2x? So that has this dependency effect that I was talking about, where I have x occurring twice in a function. Right here, x only occurs once in the function. And so there's a theorem that says that in that case, interval arithmetic does actually give you the exact range. But here I have x twice in the function. And so uh, it gives me the minimum, which is minus one. It gives me an, you know, an interval containing the minimum. That's good. But then it gives me this big, long list of boxes. So this is an effect called the cluster effect. Uh, so I'm, I'm forming a cluster of boxes around the global minimum. And as I increase, as I decrease the tolerance, I will actually get more and more boxes. That's pretty bad news. Uh, so there are various, you know, more complicated techniques that you can apply, but sort of higher order approximations of your function, et cetera, like Taylor expansions using interval arithmetic to bound things uh, that can help to get rid of this cluster effect. Okay, so, so far I've only been working in one dimension. Um, so what about higher dimensions? So suppose I have a function that I want to minimize in two dimensions, like f of xy is x squared plus y squared. Uh, so how can, I, how can I use interval arithmetic now? Well, let's replace each variable with an interval. So uh, if I do that, what am I, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna calculate capital X squared plus capital Y squared and capital X and Y intervals. And that'll give me and that'll give me an overestimate for the range because that's how interval arithmetic works. It will give me an overestimate for the range of the function over this box, x cross y, so the Cartesian product of x times y, which is gonna be a rect rectangular box of the plane. And so I, I do not have to do any extra work except for defining this interval box type in my package. And then I can immediately bound real functions of n, n variables in principle, right? Not in principle. Uh, I can bound real functions of n variables. Okay, great. So now how do I use that in you know, my global optimization routine? So let's look back at the code. And we realize that um, I wrote it in such a way that I, do, I never said that x was an interval in one dimension. This code is completely generic. It will work in any number of dimensions, in fact. Uh, so there's a little trick, which is this, this interval mid calculation. So I'm using this interval mid function that I defined here. So the syntax is a bit strange, but it's saying interval mid of X, which is of some type T and T is a subtype of region. Region is just um, the, either an interval or an interval box in N dimensions. Uh, 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 this is defined in our package. And so I'm going to do what? I'm gonna calculate mid of X. So if I calculate mid of an interval, that gives me the midpoint of the interval, right? So 1.5. And now, how do I make an interval box in Julia? So there are two different ways to do it. The, the nice way, sort of, that looks nice, is to use this backslash times, and that will literally give me the Cartesian product. And let me call that something like capital Z, Z. So in, in, in the Pluto notebook, the problem is you cannot reuse the same variable name in different places. And so I have to keep inventing new variable names, or there are ways to get around that. Okay, so now let me do mid of Z, Z. 
and that will give me the midpoint of this interval box. And that's going to be a vector, a static, a so-called static vector, which knows its length, uh, and that gives me the midpoint in each direction. And so what I'm doing here is taking that midpoint and then I, I need to convert that into an interval or an interval box. And that's what this T does, right? So if I do um, interval box of this mid, I get back a new box, which just is that one single point. And the, the point of that is that that is the way I can bound rounding errors. Every, every calculation in the interval world has to be on an interval, even if that interval is a single point. But if I, for example, I'm taking exponentials or something, then that's going to smear out my single point into when, when I take the image of that, it, it might actually have a little bit of rounding error. And I'm bounding that using interval arithmetic, which was the original goal of interval arithmetic actually was to bound rounding error. Okay. So uh, I can also, so here's another type of implementation. I don't use a, this Q anymore. I'm just doing everything with vectors. And um, so I don't want to go into the details, but the point is that this runs on the GPU as well. This code, there's 15 lines of code can do global optimization using intervals on the GPU. So the point is that Julia's GPU packages like CUDA.jl for using, so the GPU for those people who don't know is, um, is a graphics card, which is something like this big that fits in your desktop computer and turns it into a supercomputer because there are literally 5, 000, up to 5,000 processors inside this, this card that was designed for gamers to, to render 3D scenes originally. And um, so the point is that those processes, uh, you, the ideal is that you want them all to be doing exactly the same operations, the same sequence of operations, but on different data. So this is called, um, yeah, so uh, single instruction, multiple data, uh, probably uh, there's a P in there, parallel some, something. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so in Julia, there's this nice syntax f dot of v. So let's look at that. Uh, suppose I have a vector v, which is one, two, three, and uh, I have a function called uh, j of x, which is uh, you know x times two or something. Let's call that double. Double of x is x times two. Then, if I want to apply the function double to each element of v, I'm going to do double dot of v. This dot means a pointwise operation. Uh, point-wise or element-wise, right? It's, it's dot because it's point. This is, comes from MATLAB originally, but Julia has extended it to apply any function to a vector. And so um, the amazing thing about Julia's uh, GPU packages is that they try to be gen very gener generic. This is a, a theme throughout Julia, which is that, okay, suppose I now move my vector V Onto the C, onto the GPU, which I cannot show you because I need, I don't have a GPU on this machine, um, but that's easy enough, e easily done. But you just create a GPU array uh, and you pass over the data into that GPU array. Now I can use exactly the same syntax, and that will now do the calculation in parallel on the GPU. And um, so that's uh, so it's actually sort of easy to e e easy in some sense to write this code. And, and the, the point is that I am actually using my user defined type, which is you know, interval and interval box, et cetera. And I'm creating vectors of those objects on the GPU. And I basically don't know of any other system. Uh, I, think, I think now you may be able to do it, but I think uh, Julia was one of the first platforms that enabled you to create your, your user defined objects on the GPU. And, and actually think of them and reason with them in those terms and write your, the same code that works on the CPU and run it straight on the GPU. Under you know, a lot of caveats, there are a lot of restrictions of what kind of code you can run there. But it's perfect for interval arithmetic because uh, you have this huge range, this huge number of boxes that you want to be manipulating in this branch and bound algorithm. And you want to apply the function to each of them and check is the, you know, the image below your global minimum, et cetera. And that's what this code does. So that's a complete piece of code to, to run global optimization on the CPU or GPU. This algorithm that I talked about, which is the, called the more scalbo algorithm and it's from the um, 70s actually. Okay. Now, uh, so how much time do I have left? Okay, we can... Um, Depends on how much time you want to leave for questions. Uh, we have we have about 
something like 12 minutes total. Uh, okay. Maybe maybe I can ask you real quick. There was yeah. an interesting question that was, I think, partly answered, at least in the chat, but maybe you can clarify. When, um, somebody asked, does the over approximation depend on the expression graph of the function? I think they mean the analytic yeah. representation. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So that's a great question. So um, yeah, so if I have uh, some interval, uh, let's call it x1, uh, which is minus one to one, and uh, I do x1 squared minus two x1, that gives me an overestimate of the range. If I complete the square and write that as x1 minus one squared minus one, that's the same, that's mathematically the same calculation. Right, x squared minus 2x and x minus 1 squared, that's x squared minus 2x plus 1, minus 1. And that gives me a smaller uh, range. And that's because uh, there's now a single occurrence of the variable. And so I know that actually theorem, this is the true range of the function over that input set. And this is an over approximation because x occurred multiple times. And so for example, I could make it even worse by subtracting x and adding x back on, x1, and then I get an even bigger range. So yeah, it, it really matters how you write your function. But you know, you can't always simplify things, right? If I have x minus sine of x, there's no way I can simplify that to only have one copy of x. And so this is probably an overestimate of the range. Okay, so, so, so does your package Oh, sorry. Oh, go I was ahead. just going to ask a yeah. follow up. Does your package attempt to do simplifications or that's factorizations, a, or does it rely a, on the user being intelligent? That's a great question. Right now, it does not do anything clever, but I've definitely been thinking along those lines. So um, uh, there's this uh, great uh, effort recently um, by Chris Rokorkus, uh, Shashi Gauda, and um, <clears throat> Ying Boma to do symbolic manipulation in Julia using the modeling toolkit package. I don't think I'm going to be able to show you that right now, but oh, maybe I can. Uh, uh, so basically, you can define variables, which are symbolic objects like x and y. And then you can do x plus y uh, symbolically in Julia. And so now we can actually, so this gives you an object that's like a symbolic representation of your function. And you can now manipulate that and look, oh, is this x the same? Is this object x the same as this object x? And then you can do something different based on that. So that's definitely something I'm very interested in doing. And that has also, you know, people have, have, have tried to do that, a mixture of numeric and symbolic calculation for interval arithmetic. But now, you know, um, we, can, we can try and do that in Julia. And so if people uh, would like to do that, I'm very happy to discuss it. OK, so let me. Um, briefly talk about constraint satisfaction. So suppose I, I have some uh, constraint like this, complicated constraint, then I can get this picture out. This is actually a rigorous guaranteed picture in the sense that anything that is blue is guaranteed to be inside this constraint set, the feasible region. Anything that is white is outside. And then if you, can, if you look, there's this small pink region right here that is unknown. We don't know if it's inside or outside because there's again some tolerance where I finish my calculation. So um, the idea of these constraint propagation me methods is that I want a so-called contractor. So if I have an input box X, which is this whole rectangle, and here's my constraint, I want to be able to remove pieces from X that do not satisfy the constraint. So how can I do that? I'm going to use something called constraint, an algorithm called constraint propagation. So I'm going to take the syntax tree that was just mentioned of my function. So here's the syntax tree of X squared. And I'm going to introduce new variables at each um, point of the tree. And so these, uh, so like a equals x squared. And so I'm going to start from the ground, from the bottom of the tree, and I'm going to push the information up the tree. And then at the top, I'm going to impose the constraint. So in this case, I want to say x squared plus y squared less than or equal to one. I'm going to impose that at the top. And then I'm going to propagate that information back down using intervals. And so I'm not going to go through the details, but here's the calculation. So if I start with minus infinity to infinity for x and y, and then I, I, I make my, well, actually, I will go through, the, through it. So I'll, I'll make a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll make a Cartesian product of those. So I'm starting with the entire plane. And I want to find um, 
which region of that plane satisfies the constraint x squared plus y squared less than or equal to one. So I'm going to go up that tree. So I'm going to define these variables a equals x squared. And since we know that since we're working with real numbers, whenever I square anything, I only get positive numbers back. So here's my positive set of positive numbers. And uh, similarly for B. And now C is A plus B. And that again gives me a zero to infinity. And now here comes the, 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 good, the good stuff. I'm going to have my constraint, which is again a set, right? So I want the set of values of x squared plus y squared to be within minus infinity to one. And so I'm going to take the current values of C, which is x squared plus y squared, and intersect them with those values that I'm interested in, which is minus infinity to one. And when I take that intersection, I get zero to one. And now I'm going to take that information and push it back down. So I defined A to be, you know, sorry, uh, I defined um, C to be A plus B. And so A, I'm going to invert now. I'm actually going to invert this function. Of course, this is a non-invertible function. But since I'm working with sets, I'm quite capable of inverting the function and getting an over approximation for the total inverse of this function with respect to both A and B. And so here's the inverse of that function. You know, I just solve the equation for A and I get A equals C minus B. So here's my new value of C minus the old value of B. And I intersect it with the previous value of A that came from downstairs. And I get the new value of A, which is, you know, a vast reduction. And then finally, X is the square root of A, but there's a positive and a negative square root. And so I evaluate those and I get that X has to be within minus one to one. So in 10 steps, I've started from the entire plane and I've squashed it down. And I'm saying that all of the points that satisfy this equation live in the box minus one to one squared. So there's a super powerful technique when it, when it actually works. This is called the forward backward contractor or HC4, uh, HC4 revised. And so um, in the interval constraint programming package that I wrote, you actually can do this automatically. So you, there's this contractor macro, which takes in this piece of Julia syntax and sort of looks at it and says, oh, what operations are you doing? Well, you're doing, you know, it, it basically by automatically introduces these new variables, just like I did by hand just now. And then on the, in the backwards pass, it inverts them using these reverse functions that are defined. You know, you have to go and define all these reverse functions that, that invert all these operations. And so you can actually do this automatically and you get something like um, this. So this is, uh, a, you know, here's, I just, so basically what are we doing? Sorry, um, I'm specifying declaratively my constraint and I'm trying to solve the constraint satisfaction or feasible set or feasible region problem in this box. And I'm going to do that in a very similar way using a branch and now contract algorithm, uh, use, uh, sorry, uh, using these contractors. And this is what happens is exactly the same kind of algorithm, same kind of idea. I'm now in two dimensions and I'm looking for the set of boxes that satisfies this constraint and purple are inside and, and white is outside and orange is on the boundary, et cetera. And so that, can be applied in global optimization um, because I'm going to add a constraint that f of x is less than m into my global optimization algorithm. And that actually makes it much more efficient, especially in higher dimensions. OK, so I should uh, finish off. So basically, in summary, um, you know, I hope I've shown you that calculating with sets is a very powerful tool and actually necessary in many applications. So uh, yes, yeah, so I should just mention um, one. Uh, uh, one calculation that I, I did recently, which is this, this particular function that I showed, which is called the Grevenk test function. It has a load of roots of uh, you know, stationary points, which are roots of the gradient of that function. And we can actually find and verify 1 million stationary points in two dimensions in less than one second on the GPU. So this is, so the CPU version is about two orders of magnitude faster than a well-known package in MATLAB. Uh, written by Siegfried Rump, who's one of the world experts on interval arithmetic. But MATLAB is just the wrong tool to write these things in, right? Just rewriting it in Julia immediately gives you this two orders of magnitude speed up. And then, re and then writing you know, the same code running on the GPU now gives me another two orders of magnitude speed up. Okay, so calculating with sets is a powerful tool and interval arithmetic allows us to do that. And it has many applications in scientific computing. So as uh, Dominique mentioned, I have these two tutorials from JuliaCon this year, uh, which may be useful, uh, one on interval methods and one on learning Julia. 
and uh, there are more learning resources in, in this website. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks very much, David. Um, does anyone want to jump in with uh, questions? Uh, well, Dominic, I have a question. Can I ask? It? Can I? Uh, well, can I uh, do it? Can I uh, make it? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so thank you, da da uh, David, uh, for your speech. That was really interesting. I have just one question. You yeah. only show some. Uh, the, you only show that your method works with uh, well function with two variables. One oh, variable yeah. because it's simpler. It's simpler to uh, it's simpler to see. But my question is, okay, what is the maximum variable generally that yeah, you? Yeah. Um, great question. So here's what here's, here's the Grevenk function. Uh, so this is a function that works in any number of dimensions, and it has is basically a quadratic, and then it has these high frequency oscillations. And so um, here I'm optimizing it. You know, here's an interval box minus 100 to 100 with two dimensions, and let's. Uh, let's minimize the function over that input box so that for some reason the, the code seems to be running a bit slowly uh, right now. I'm not sure why that this should be an instantaneous calculation. Um, anyway, yeah, so definitely in the past I have optimized this particular Greek bank. So, so this particular function is particularly easy actually to optimize using interval methods and I've got up to 500 dimensions. So that took about 10 minutes to find the global minimum of this function in, in, 10, in 500 dimensions. Okay, thank you. Uh, but, but, you know, this, um, this uh, <clears throat> Leonard Jones example is a very difficult problem. Uh, it's only nine dimensions and it's very difficult to find it. Okay, let me rephrase. It's actually very quick to find the global minimum you can find the global minimum in under one second. The problem is proving that that is the global minimum, actually. To prove that that's the global minimum, you have to explore the entire space and throw away all the boxes because you can prove that they are all above the, you know, their image lies above the global minimum. And that is, you know, very expensive. So um, this is a problem that was studied by Charlie Van Aray, who I started collaborating with recently uh, in his thesis uh, about in 2014-ish. Uh, and he, you know, with his code at that time, um, he could find the global minimum in 0.1 seconds, and then it took 1400 seconds to prove that it was the global minimum of, of this function. I think uh, with the GPU, especially, we can do better than that. I've been working on that, but I, I, I yeah, I, I think it should be a few seconds now on the GPU. Um, so, you know, the world record for this, so, you know, people, people minimize uh, m clusters like this with 5,000 5,000 atoms using stochastic optimization methods, but they can never be sure that they've actually found the global minimum. If you want to prove that you have the global minimum, then five atoms is currently the world record, apparently. So, you know, I hope we can do at least six now. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it, it, this function, you know, I mean, it's, of course, it, you can't visualize it in nine dimensions, but I presume that what's happening is that it's sort of really oscillatory but in a very you know, more significant way than, um, than this, this Grevenk example. It's sort of, it really goes up and down a lot. And you know, there are a lot of local minima that are close to the global minimum, maybe. I, I'm not sure really what's going on. And of course, I'd like to apply these techniques to neural networks to understand. I had you know, a feeling we should have. Uh, I had a feeling we should have planned about three hours for your talk and yes. discussion. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> uh, does it? Does anyone else uh, uh, have a question? Um, yeah. Hi, David. Um, thanks a lot hey. for the talk. Sure. Um, I was wondering, did you compare uh, your current package with some other spatial branching solvers, the traditional ones, say Baron and so on, so the global uh, optimization yeah. solvers? Great question. Yeah, so I have not done that comparison. Again, Charlie Van Aray uh, did that comparison, and mm -hmm. of course, Baron and Kuen are very fast, but they are not uh, guaranteed to be. They're not guaranteed. They're not. You know, they're not rigorous, basically. Yep. And so it turns out that he found that Baron, Baron and Kuen actually uh, gave you a global minimum that was too low. So it was actually not. You know, there was so no feasible, feasible point, point that actually or... had that. I mean, by, by a very small amount, right? I mean, there's basically floating point error, but um, yes, that's, that's a bit unfortunate. 
Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it was a very good question. And uh, at, at the beginning, also, you showed one of the features was uh, showing that a value was in the image of a set or of an interval. Uh, yeah, that was quite at the beginning. I should have maybe asked the question at this point, like uh, something in the image of H of some interval X. Uh, I'm not sure it was in the notebook, I think. And yeah, I would, so oh, yeah, you yeah. Return, you're returning a Boolean uh, right. in this. But yeah. are there some values for which uh, you don't know if uh, if there is this uh, this okay. value in the image? And in this case, what what do you return? What's the API? So yeah, so uh, okay, so I am not calculating the image. Mm -hmm. I'm calculating an overestimate of the image yep. in general. And so, uh, but it's just a set, right? So I'm just checking if a value is in that set or not. Mm -hmm. So that that's a boolean, a normal boolean. But yeah, right. so um, we've had a lot of discussions, you know. Uh, especially with um, Joshua Graviter, who uh, uh, is a PhD student, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, so suppose, yeah, so, okay. So suppose I have an interval one to three and I check, is that less than five? Of course, mm -hmm. it, the whole interval is less than five. So it's clear what you should return. But yep. what if I check if it's less than two, right? That's your, mm -hmm. I think that's your question. And so, you would like to return a, a third value, which is sort of yes and no, and no, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but currently we don't. So currently uh, it's not true that this interval is totally less than two. And so okay, we return yeah. false. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, so his point is that this is actually bad idea for if you want to put intervals into a lot of other algorithms, because it does not behave like a number mm -hmm. really should, right? So we're currently claiming that an interval is a number, but of course it isn't. And it's actually a set. And so, um, yeah, that's a, a big issue. So he actually wrote a sort of um, pa a package called number intervals where intervals actually behave like numbers. And this will give you missing, I believe. This, okay, yeah. Um, this so you give see you a third, a free, like value, a free value logic. logic. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think he's actually, you know, I was not convinced at the start that that was a good idea, but now I am pretty convinced that we should actually do that. Okay, yeah. Thanks. I'm going to follow up this question. Hi, David. Oh, hi. Um, could we imagine that because there's part of the interval that's below two and part of it that's above two, Yeah. if that happens, it's in some code that already exists and then you plug in intervals, yeah. Yeah. that this part of the code gets duplicated somehow oh. because it, it satisfies both conditions, basically. So both conditions should be satisfied yeah. in, in both that's a branches great, should run at right some that's a great point. question yeah so i i that that's something i've discussed with valentin Trurabi at mit uh he has a package uh so basically so in order to do that you would need to analyze the code of your function and basically take both branches when it was necessary you know suppose you have an if in your function so currently you cannot really use if if statements in functions yep. with interval arithmetic for this reason, but his, uh, you know, he he was saying that you you can you can do that if you, you know, sort of have something that is able to to run both branches of your code under these circumstances. So you can certainly imagine doing that. Right now, what I would do is actually think uh, actually define a piecewise uh, function mm -hmm. uh, yep. instead of an if and 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 do it like that. And and basically, again, you would split up your your function into, uh, you know, you would, you would take the intersection of your interval, sorry, your input interval, you would take the intersection with each piece that you wanted to, to study your function on. And yeah, but it's a, it's a good question. So Julia has this tool cassette that in principle should enable us to do things like that. Um, but I haven't gone into that gone in any that. detail yet. Okay. So the piecewise would, as you said, you would do the intersection with each test. And then you would do the yeah. whole or the union at exactly. the, for the outputs. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, so I Thank have you. I have an implementation of that that I published on this course at some point. Um, Julia is quite famous for its autodiff capability. Are there yeah. any interesting intersections Thanks. between integral arithmetic and autodiff? Yeah, I didn't have time to talk about that, but I love love that subject. So um, yeah, so if you, if you want to find you know roots, how do you do it? Uh, in with intervals, right? So, um, so one, what you what you can do is is this thing called the interval Newton method, which is a variant of the Newton algorithm um, 
the standard Newton algorithm for finding roots. So how does that work? Let me just show a visualization uh, if I have time. Um, so, so what do we have here? We have a function, which is just x squared minus two, my favorite function, you know, which has one root here, which I want to find. I'm starting with this complete interval here. And so what I'm going to do is something like the standard Newton method. But um, so I'm going to calculate the gradient, you know, the tangent, the, the, the derivative, basically, calculate the derivative of my function at this point, except that um, it's not at that point. I'm going to calculate the derivative at all points in this interval. And that's what all of these sloping lines are. Right? So normally in the standard Newton method, you would calculate the tangent line, but I'm actually calculating the derivative at all points in this interval. And that's what all of these uh, gray lines are. And now I'm going to intersect all of those with the x-axis. And that gives me this red interval here. And you can see that it contains the root. And that's because the mean value theorem tells you that it has to contain the root. So this is like a constructive version of the mean value theorem. Um, and so I'm going to iterate now. I'm going to now, you know, at the next step, I'll take this interval and I'll do the same calculation. So I'll take, um, hello? Sorry, it's not working for some reason. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, so, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, so I'm going to, so now I'm taking this input interval and I do the same calculation and now I, I, I get this output interval. And so I keep on iterating and you see that it very rapidly converges to the root. And so uh, the interval Newton method is actually quadratic, just like the new standard Newton method as, as once you're close enough. And what happens if there are, if, if there's a zero of the derivative, I actually get this double cone. And when I intersect that double cone with the, the x-axis, I get two intervals. And then I act on each of those independently. So then I get two of these cones and I keep on iterating and I find all of the roots again. So how does that this interval Newton method work? I'm going to use forward diff and I'm going to define. So this is actually in, in two dimensions now. I'm going to define the Jacobian. Here's my function that I want to find roots of. And um, I'm going to def define. Uh, oh. oh dear. Sorry. What's going on? Okay, so I can calculate the Jacobian using this forward diff package, which does forward mode automatic differentiation. Right? So I'm just giving Julian my function. I calculate the Jacobian. That gives me a matrix, the Jacobian at this vector 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But now I can actually take in a vector of intervals, otherwise known as an interval box, which is this capital Y. This is a vector of intervals that is supposed to, that actually I know, you know, a priori contains a root of this function. Now I'm going to calculate the Jacobian of that function over this interval box. And it gives me a matrix of intervals. So I did not program anything you know, to do this. I am just applying the same forward diff package now on my vector of intervals instead of a vector of, um, uh, of numbers. OK, so I, the only thing I did was add this, add this line Jacobian of you know, I have to extract the data out of my interval box object. And now I'm going to define this Newton operator. How do I define that? It's uh, given by, where is that? It's given by this expression. I take the midpoint of x minus f of the midpoint of x divided by f prime of x. So this looks very much like the standard Newton, you know, uh, Newton algorithm, but I'm taking the midpoint here and then the entire, der the derivative evaluated over the entire interval here. That's, that's what, where I was calculating the derivative at all points of the interval. And that will give me an interval answer, uh, which is this intersection with the x-axis of all of those slopes. And in, in higher dimensions, it's the same, but now I take the Jacobian and I calculate the, the solution of solving this Jacobian uh, backslash so solve the linear system of the Jacobian with f of m over here. And uh, so that's, again, similar to the standard Newton method in higher dimensions, but, but now with intervals. And the theorem is that if, the, when I evaluate this Newton operator on the function over this interval box, if that is contained inside the original interval, then theorem, there is a unique root of the function inside that box. And that's 
happening here. And so I actually know that I have found a unique root of this function inside this, this input box. And um, yeah, so, so here I'm, I'm basically using Julia's standard. Uh, I'm not sure what this backslash is doing, if that's a special overload that we have or, or not, but I could in principle use Julia's standard backslash operator, except that's where we found one of these issues that I was talking about where because uh, we don't actually have real numbers and we claim that we do, we were, there was actually a, a, a big problem with that. And so I think we now have our own extended version of backslash in the package. Um, that, one more question point? about this code. Um, yeah. Can you distinguish single roots from like double roots? Yeah, good question. So uh, interval methods are, are not able to prove the existence of double roots. They will just tell you that, that it doesn't know if there's a root there. That's because uh, anything that you do with intervals has to be some kind of open condition and a double root is not an open condition. So if you perturb the system, then you lose the double root. So the only way you can really rigorously prove the existence of double roots is using symbolic techniques and proving that there's a zero of the derivative as well. Well, thank you. Uh, we're quite a bit over. Maybe uh, maybe I can get the one last question in real quick. Uh, ages ago, I used interval arithmetic and propagation okay. techniques to prove and disprove convexity properties of okay. functions. Is that, is that something that could be useful in the, the kind of algorithm yeah. you're working on? Uh, that's, uh, so yeah, we, uh, so for example, uh, to prove monotonicity, uh, we can definitely use uh, is that convexity. Yeah, I, I've wondered about convexity. I'm not sure how that, um, how, how we can use convexity in these kind of algorithms, but yeah, we should definitely talk about that. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. I oh, think, you. you know, the fact that we go over is, a, is just an indication of how enjoyable it is. And um, uh, this was really, I thought, a great illustration of, uh, of important methods in optimization and then the power of Julia to uh, and its ability to implement them easily, really. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm really grateful that you accepted the invitation. It's great to have you with us. Um, even for a short moment. And uh, we hope uh, you'll be back when uh, optimization days happen in person, <laughs> uh, hopefully in the <laughs> near so, future. Yeah. <laughs> um, and well, so, um, yeah, I, I wanna thank everybody for coming really. And, uh, and again, uh, we wish uh, everybody a, a happy new year and, and all the best for 2021 and a lot of global minima. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Don't Great thanks seeing you. very much for the invitation. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, bye. Bye.